A Year in the Motherland, an illustrated lecture by Lieutenant Colonel T. M. Seeley, late of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Digitization and narration by Avalon Eman. Scenes which daily meet the gaze of our lads training in the military camps of England. The flag, the emblem of liberty, the badge of the greatest empire in the history of the world, and one of the oldest and foremost democracy. For millions of people in every clime fondly claim it as their own, and all foreigners whose thoughts and nations are governed by the golden rule look upon it with respect and reverence. Little wonder that when this flag was threatened by a jealous, grasping, and cruel monarch, that Britons of all races and climes should rally to its defense. Canadians were among the first to answer the bugle call. They came not only from our fair province, but from the banks of the Ottawa and the St. Lawrence, where the falls of Montmorency tumble noisily from a height greater than Niagara, and from the crowded city. This view is of St. James Street, Montreal, showing the Bank of Montreal and the Post Office. Also of Montreal, showing the YMCA and St. James's Cathedral. All classes of the population, the farmers and the fisher folk, the mechanic and those of higher education, furnish their quota. I have seen a whole battalion of McGill University students parading on the grounds of that famous institution, a view of which you now behold. Those who go down to the sea in ships behold the wonders of the deep. A most wonderful thing is a gigantic iceberg in the North Atlantic. But my purpose is to show you something of what the eyes of your boys behold while traveling and training in England. Few countries have more to show in the way of choice scenic gems than England. Other lands may have higher mountains, broader rivers, and loftier waterfalls, for the motherland is not noted for its big features and the ways of natural endowments. But nature has arranged many a picture of surpassing beauty in rural England. A view of Millersdale in Derbyshire. Cottage on a lake. Tree growth is slow in England, and it is safe to say we can measure the growth of these trees by centuries. Typical stone cottage roofed with terracotta tiles of fanciful form and fresh color, and pleasing contrast with the gray stone of the walls and with the green foliage with which it is surrounded. An interior. A peep inside one of those old cottages is interesting. Some rare bits of old chinaware may be seen on the plate rail. A country house of more pretentious style and size. Even the smaller buildings have massive walls from two to four feet thick. House on a lake. The irregular outline of the roofs of some of those old houses suggests to the uninitiated an early collapse, but the occupants go on living in them with apparent sense of security. A wooded drive. A common sight on the country roads of southern England. The landowners have always been very jealous of their trees, not allowing any to be cut. Things have changed since the war. The Canadian lumbermen are laying low many a lordly forest. Cottage in the wood. When the town people of England build country homes, they select closely wooded sites. In many instances, they have beautiful gardens, all hedged and walled in from public view. Half-timbered cottage. The half-timbered style of architecture is much affected. In the older types, the exposed timbers are structural parts of the buildings, but in the newer types, the half-timbering is only an external decoration. Farmyard. In the parts of England which I frequented, one would rarely see a large barn. The prevailing custom is to build a series of small buildings around three sides of a square. The walls of the farm buildings are sometimes of brick, but generally of stone, while the roofs are of tile, slate, or thatch, never wood. In England, the term shingle means stones on the beach. Prize cow. Excellent stock may be seen in those English farmyards. Note example, thatched roofs. Cattle grazing. Occasional bits of scenery reminds one strongly of this province. There are many pastures and fields clothed in rich verdure, but there is also much land cumbered with gorse and heather, useless shrubs which the natives seem to hold in reverence. Churchyard and countryside at Elsdon, Northumberland. Perhaps the most attractive features of rural England is its church architecture. In the smallest villages may be found churches with beautifully and artistically proportioned towers, windows, arches, and columns, all of which proclaim these structures to be houses of worship. Church interior. A church at Cockham, a small village at the top of the Cliveden Reach on the Thames. Near here is the Toplow Hospital for Canadians, on the property of William Astor, purchased some twenty years ago from the Duke of Devonshire, our present Governor-General. 
Very likely some of our Canadian boys attend service in this very edifice. Note the massive arches and pillars, all of stone. Ancient style of church sometimes seen in rural England. Note the way of solving the roofing problem. A stroll through one of those old graveyards is sure to be fraught with interest. Many a quaint and curious inscription may be found. The Shepherd's Grave. We offer no apology for our interest in the last resting place of the dead. Were we to fail to take an interest in those things, the dumb brutes would put me to shame. Winter Scene. Climatic conditions prevailing in southern England are not very different from those in Nova Scotia, except that the cold spells are not so intense in England. The winter of 1917 was thought by the natives to be very severe. The lowest temperature reported for the London district was 15 above zero. Further north, it was much colder, of course. There being so little ice-making weather, the South Britain does not excel in ice sports as he does in many other lines. And little wonder, seeing that the gentle art is attended by no small degree of danger. Yacht on River Englishmen are more proficient on the water when in its fluid state. Some very noted races have taken place on English waters, both inland and coastal. It is natural that this line of sport should be encouraged, since England's life and the life of the whole empire depends on British supremacy on the seas. Prow of Ship So it is that the spirits of Drake and Nelson abide with the people from one generation to another. Vice Admiral Beatty We used to hear a great deal about the effet English race. The very people who spread that theory are learning to their sorrow that there is nothing in it. The breed of heroes still lives. Shoreham Harbour. Not a very interesting scene, but shown because many of the Canadians were camped near this place. Bournemouth. One of the fashionable watering places on the English coast. Douglas, Isle of Man. A favourite seaside resort. Close to this town is a large internment camp for German prisoners. Norwegian Barkentine. The old windjammers still have their mission, and since the U-boat frightfulness, they seem to be coming into their own once more. Steamer. The commerce carriers go on their way much as before, a testimonial to the bravery of the officers and men of the merchant marine. Everywhere the British warship is in evidence. In this case, the artist must have been taking something, or he would not have seen so many aircraft. He has clearly laid himself open to the charge of seeing double, at least. St. Paul's Cathedral. We now leave the country and seaside and visit mighty London, the greatest city the world has ever seen. The population of London is seven and a quarter millions. There are nearly one hundred million inhabited houses. Greater London is included within a radius of twelve to fifteen miles from Charing Cross, the traffic center of London. Old London, called locally the city, occupies only one square mile. It is this part over which the Lord Mayor has jurisdiction. There are in the greater city twenty-seven boroughs, each with its mayor and board of aldermen. The old city has many ancient privileges of which it is very jealous. When the sovereign enters the city, he is met at the temple bar by the Lord Mayor and tendered the sword of state. There is but one regiment of soldiers allowed to march through old London with flying colours, and that is the Royal Fusiliers, the old city of London regiment. The Dome of St. Paul's is the most prominent object in the whole city. The site has been occupied by a place of worship from prehistoric times. This is the third St. Paul's, the first having been erected in the 7th century. It was burned down in 1087. Another was started at once, and it is this which is meant when old St. Paul's is spoken of. It, in turn, was burned down in the Great London Fire of 1666. The Altar of St. Paul's. The present St. Paul's is the third largest church in Christendom. St. Peter's in Rome, and the Milan Cathedral being larger. Its erection was commenced by Sir Christopher Wren in 1675. It was opened in 1679, and was completed in 1710. Sir Christopher, beside being a clever architect, was a wonderful man. While building St. Paul's, he designed and superintended the erection of thirty other churches, each one a thing of beauty, and no two alike. There are many monuments in the cathedral, including those of Nelson, Wellington, Gordon, and other famous Britons. There is, however, no special monument to Wren the architect. Instead, there is the Latin inscription, the sense of which is, Reader, if thou seekest his monument, look around. He died at the age of ninety-one. In his old age, he insisted on being taken to the cathedral once a year, 
and placed under the dome, where he could contemplate the achievement of his intellect. This view shows the altar and the reverdos of white marble, flanked by an open colonnade. The sculptures represent the incarnation and life of our Lord. The niche over the pediment is occupied by figures of the Virgin and Child, the statues of St. Peter and St. Paul standing beside, with the risen Saviour above. The height of the whole work is sixty feet. Interior of Brompton Oratory, Roman Catholic There are upwards of 1,600 churches in London, many of them noted for some reason or other. As it is intended to refer somewhat fully to Westminster Abbey, an inspection of the interior of this famous Roman Catholic Church must suffice. It was opened in 1884 by the late Cardinal Manning. It is after the Italian style. The late Cardinal Newman was associated with this church, and his statue stands just outside the walls of the edifice. The late Cardinal is well known throughout Christendom as the author of that delightful hymn, Lead Kindly Light. The Royal Exchange Returning to the old city, we see the Royal Exchange. This photo was taken when the building was decorated for King Edward VII's coronation. The first Royal Exchange was opened in 1571 by Queen Elizabeth and was destroyed in the Great Fire. The present exchange was opened by Her Majesty Queen Victoria in 1844. One of the places from which the ascension of the Sovereign is proclaimed is the steps of the Royal Exchange. There are many fine statues and frescoes in the building. In connection with this building is Lloyd's subscription room, where anyone can get a premium quoted on any form of risk. It takes its name from Lloyd's Coffee House, where ship owners were accustomed to foregather in the 17th century. Lloyd's maintains a large staff of reporters in all parts of the world to report the movements of shipping. Lloyd's Shipping Registry, which classifies ships, is a different concern. Directly across from the Royal Exchange is the Bank of England, covering some four acres of ground. The vaults contain some 20 million pounds in gold and silver. 1,000 people were employed before the war, but the number has been greatly increased since. Land in this vicinity is worth a quarter of a million pounds per acre, or, say, $2.50 a square inch. Cheapside, a street in the neighborhood of the bank. One thing that is not noticeably cheap here is land. This is one of the busiest thoroughfares in London. It leads through a short continuation called Poultry Street to the bank. There are many banks in London, but when one says the bank, he is always understood as meaning the Bank of England. Seven important thoroughfares meet at the bank underground station. At any hour of the day may be seen a bewildering stream of taxis, motors, buses, carts, cycles, and pedestrians. 690 buses have been counted in one hour. In the tube, or underground railway, are 600 trains per day. This will give a slight idea of the volume of traffic at this point, only one of the several traffic centers in London. The Guild Hall, where the mayor and council meet, is one of the group of famous buildings which cluster around the bank. Tower of London, historically the most interesting shot in England. It is made up of 13 towers connected by stone walls. This is a view of the Devereux Tower. The whole occupies 13 acres of land. It was built by William the Conqueror 1,000 years ago. It is guarded by a corps of old soldiers of Meredith's service, called the Beefeaters. The tower has been for many years, and still is, the state prison of the nation, and its ancient walls have confined many famous personages. The tower, interior view. It also partakes of the nature of a national museum. This shows the effigy of King Henry VIII in armor. The crown jewels, valued at five millions of pounds, are kept in the Wakefield Tower, and many objects of rare value and interest are kept on view within these ancient precincts. The Tower Bridge, one of the numerous bridges across the Thames. Whereas the tower is one of the most ancient objects to be seen in London, the Tower Bridge is quite modern. It was opened by King Edward, when Prince of Wales, in 1894. With its approaches, it is half a mile long. The central span is 200 feet long and can be opened in one and a half minutes for the passage of shipping. Tabard Inn. This is the spot from whence the Canterbury Pilgrim set out, as described by the poet Chaucer. Close by in South London is the site of the White Hart Inn, where Mr. Pickwick encountered the jovial Sam Weller. Many of these old places are being removed to make way for modern structures. The Old Curiosity Shop immortalized by Charles Dickens in his pathetic story of Little Nell. Holborn Circus 
The term circus, as applied to several centres in London, has no reference to elephants, clowns, and monkeys. It means the point where several streets converge. Holborn Circus is an important shopping centre. Piccadilly, a fashionable part of the city, celebrated for its fine hotels, clubs, stores, and residences. Note the style of bus with double deck, very popular in England. Gladstone advised an American friend that the best way to see London was from the top of a bus. Nelson's Monument, Trafalgar Square. This monument is a prominent feature in this part of the city. The National Art Gallery is seen in the background. In this building is kept some of the most notable pictures in the world, purchased by the nation at a great price. In the foreground is the monument of King Charles I. The place of his execution is not far from this spot. Corner of Trafalgar Square, showing fountain and part of St. Martin's Church. Statues of General Havelock, General Gordon, and other great men who have served their nation well are to be seen in Trafalgar Square. This is a favourite place for Londoners to hold their open-air meetings. The great recruiting meetings for Kitchener's army were held here. The Marble Arch, corner of Hyde Park. A royal procession is here in progress. There are many parks in London, but Hyde Park is the most famous of them all. It contains 361 acres of land, with grand old trees, lawns, walks, bandstands, a large lake called the Serpentine, etc. Thousands of people spend time Sunday afternoons in Hyde Park. Rotten Row, a driveway in Hyde Park, where fashionable people exercise their horses when they own any, or watch other people do so in the other case. Kensington Gardens, adjoining Hyde Park. In the background is seen Kensington Palace, built by William III. Here it was that Queen Victoria spent her childhood. Facing another angle of the gardens is the statue of the Prince Consort, husband of Queen Victoria. Under the canopy is the statue of the Prince in bronze, of heroic size, in his robes of the Order of the Garter. Around the base are statues in life-size of 178 persons famous in the arts. This monument is 175 feet in height, and is splendidly embellished with statues in bronze, marble, and colored stone. Directly opposite the monument is the Albert Hall, which will seat 8,000 people. It has one of the finest organs in the world, containing 9,000 pipes. Concerts in which the leading artists of the world take part are frequently given at the Albert Hall. The Albert Museum at Kensington is not concerned with antiquities, which branch is left to the British Museum, but rather with exhibits of the resources of the Empire. Sample products of all the colonies and of India are shown here. Hard by is the Colonial Institute, which is of great interest from an industrial point of view. These buildings contain the University of London. Buckingham Palace. Returning to the Westminster District, we see the town residence of King George and Queen Mary. It was here that King Edward was born and died. The palace faces St. James Park and was built in 1703 by the Duke of Buckingham. It was purchased by King George III, who preferred it to St. James Palace, which stands nearby. This latter palace is now used for ceremonial and foreign ambassadors are still accredited to the court of St. James. The embankment showing the Thames and Cleopatra's needle brought from Egypt some 30 or 40 years ago. Canadian arch at Whitehall, erected at the time of coronation, said to have been the finest decoration of its kind on the line of march. Whitehall is used as an administrative building, just around the corner is Downing Street, where is situated the office of the Prime Minister. In the same vicinity are the Horse Guards, War Office, and the Admiralty. The changing of guard in the forenoon daily is one of the sights of London. In the early days of the war, Lord Kitchener was a familiar figure here. Although he is absent in the flesh, his spirit goes marching on. Sir Douglas Haig is very seldom seen in London, his duties requiring him at the front. If the chin is an indication of character, it is safe to trust the campaign to Haig, don't you think so? Admiral Jellicoe who did so well as commander of the fleet, has been recalled as an advisor of the government, first Lord of Admiralty and Chief of Naval Staff. Westminster Abbey. At the bottom of Whitehall and opposite Parliament Square is the splendid stone structure of Westminster Abbey, one of the most ancient and beautiful buildings to be seen in Europe. It is the work of many centuries, a supreme triumph in architecture. Tradition says the ground was the site of a house of worship since the early part of the Christian era. The abbey was founded by Edward the Confessor in 1049. Nearly every century since has seen some addition or improvement to the original structure. View of the nave of the abbey with the shrine of the Confessor in the foreground. 
in the abbey reposes the dust of many of the kings and queens, nobles and notables of ancient Britain. This thought, accentuated by the magnificent arches, awe-inspiring in their grandeur, the beautiful stained glass, mellowed with age, and the splendid sculpture, cannot but move the soul of the most callous to feelings of religious reverence. The pulpit. For hundreds of years, from the time of Edward the Confessor until King George the Third, the sovereigns of Britain were buried in the abbey. There are also, on every hand, monuments or tablets to the memory of statesmen and warriors, artists and men of letters. The organ screen and choir stall is in the foreground. The choir occupies three or four bays in the nave, an unusual practice in church building. The organ is a splendid instrument of four manuals and pedal board, and sixty-six stops. It is divided and occupies space on either side. The organist occupies a seat on a bridge supported by the top of the screen, where the keyboards are placed. The present organist's name is Bridge, a Sir Knight famous in the musical world. East side of the north transept. Statesman Corner, showing statues of Sir Robert Peel, Disraeli, and others. Gladstone statue has been placed here since this photo was taken. Opposite side of the north transept. The statues are Earl of Mansfield, Lord Chief Justice, 1856, Robert, 2nd Marquis of Londonderry, three naval captains, Blair, Blaine, and Lord Mansfield, Viscount Palmerston, William Pitt, Earl of Chatham, Similar memorials line the aisles and walls of the abbey at every turn. Shrine of Edward the Confessor Back of the high altar and Rodreros is ample space, in which are to be seen the tombs of royalty and a few other notable personages. The famous coronation chair was kept here formerly, but it is now kept in a safer place. This chair is the most famous piece of furniture in the world. It was made for Edward I, and all British sovereigns since his time have occupied it at the coronation ceremony. The famous stone of scone, which is built into it, was brought from Scotland in 1297, the Scottish kings having used it for coronation ceremonial for centuries before. Tradition has it that this is the very stone upon which Jacob pillowed his head at Bethel. Tomb of Mary of Scotland The fact that some of the notables met their death by violent means did not prevent their remains from being interred in the abbey. Oliver Cromwell and a score of the Puritan leaders were buried in the abbey about 1661, but at the time of the Restoration their bodies were exhumed and dishonoured. The feeling towards dissenters has softened down since that time. I noticed a memorial in the abbey to John and Charles Wesley. Tomb of the Queen Elizabeth, whose life story is familiar to every school child. A whole evening would not suffice to tell of the wonders of Westminster Abbey. King Henry VII built a large addition to the abbey, which he called the Chapel of Our Lady of Sorrows. It is now commonly called Henry the Seventh Chapel. The stalls of the Knights of the Order of the Bath are here. The banner of the Knights are seen suspended over the stalls, and beneath the stalls are seats of the Esquires. The Chapel of the Order of St. Michael and St. George is in St. Paul's Cathedral, and the Chapel of the Order of the Garter is in St. George's Windsor Castle. The Houses of Parliament are opposite the Abbey in the Borough of Westminster. They cover eight acres. The building was designed by Sir Charles Barry and was completed in 1857, at a cost of three million pounds. The river façade is 940 feet long. The old Royal Palace of Westminster formerly occupied this site. The Westminster Hall, in connection, was built with by William Rufus, and later King Stephen added a chapel to it. The tower shown here is called King Stephen's Tower, and it is 316 feet high. The clock has a minute hand 16 feet long and an hour hand of 9 feet. The bell which tolls the hours weighs 14 tons. It is called Big Ben. Showing another section of exterior of Parliament building as seen from Poet's Corner of Westminster Abbey. Referring to Westminster Hall, I should have said it has the largest roof unsupported by pillars of any building in the world. It is 238 by 67 and a half feet. St. Stephen's Hall is built of the site of St. Stephen's Chapel, which was destroyed by fire in 1634. In that hall, Parliament met for many centuries. Brass plates show the site of the Speaker's Chair and the Clerk's Table. Statues shown in this view are William Pitt, Earl of Chatham, Walpole, Selden, Hampton, and Clarendon. David Lloyd George, British Prime Minister. In times of great emergency, there are always strong men raised up to lead the nation to victory. Not many years ago, Lloyd George was known as a Little England. Fortunately, he has changed his viewpoint and developed into the greatest statesman of his time. 
House of Commons. The Speaker's chair is seen in the centre. The government benches are on the right and the opposition on the left of the Speaker's chair. The front benches are occupied by the cabinet ministers or ex-ministers. Below the Speaker is the table of the Clerk of the House and on this table reposes the mace, the symbol of the dignity and privileges of the House. Over the Speaker's chair is the press gallery and above that is the grill behind which ladies may sit. The stranger's gallery is in the end toward us and is not shown in this view. The king's robing room showing the fireplace. This room is richly adorned with frescoes and panels representing the legends of King Arthur. On the occasion of opening the house, their majesties vest themselves in their official robes in this room, and with their attendants proceed to the House of Lords, where the speech from the throne is read. The House of Lords is a sumptuously gilded and decorated chamber, ninety feet long, forty-five wide, and forty-five high. It is lighted by day by twelve stained-glass windows, containing portraits of the kings and queens of England. In the niches between the windows are statues of the barons who compelled King John to sign the Magna Carta. There are here red Morocco benches to seat 550 noble lords. The cross benches are occupied by the princes of the blood, and seats on either side are reserved for foreign ambassadors and other distinguished visitors. In front of the thrones is the famous wool sack, upon which sits the Lord Chancellor. At the end of the chamber towards us is the bar of the house, at which the commons attend to hear the speech from the throne, or the royal assent, as it is given to bills passed by Parliament. Around the upper part are galleries for the reporters and visitors. Thrones of the kings and queens of Britain, the beloved sovereigns of the great empire of which we form a part. The throne is the focus point of authority of this old, the oldest and greatest and freest of all democracies the world has yet seen. A democracy whose constitution has been evolved out of the labors and pains of centuries by people constantly striving toward better methods, greater freedom, and a sane and safe citizenship. King George V and Queen Mary As a proof that the throne of Britain rests upon a firm foundation, it is only necessary to cite the devotion of all classes to the royal family. The King and Queen and the young Prince of Wales have endeared themselves to the people, more than ever since the beginning of the war, by their kindly and tactful attitude on all matters touching the happiness and welfare of their subjects of all degrees. Furthermore, it is affirmed that the royal court was never so free of off-colour individuals as at the present time. The British crown is the keystone in the arch of the empire. We count among our fellow subjects teeming millions of Orientals and peoples of colour. They can understand about a king with his crown and kingly robes and ceremonies and all that belong to the sovereign of a mighty empire, and they can understand nothing less than that. Our way is the better way for us. Photographs of Canadian Troops Sir Robert Borden taking the salute of Canadians in France A shelled chateau A street in Ypres. Cathedral Tower in Ypres. Gas shells near Canadian lines. Gas is creeping along the ground. Picture of a tank. Kite balloon descending. A bad landing by a biplane. On the sum, airplane photo over reserve trench. Frontline German trench after bombardment. Fritz found by the Canadians in Croissalet. Entrance to a German officer's dugout. Shrapnel bursting over Canadian trench. Waiting to go into the firing line. Over the top, Canadians charging at the sun. No man's land before the Canadian lines at Courcelette. German wounded taken prisoners at Merlincourt. Canadians with German helmets. Canadian stays bag of prisoners on the sun. Testing a captured German machine gun. Returning from the trenches. Lorries Ammunition Park. Moving up the heavy guns. 
heavy howitzer in action. Shrapnel bursting over Canadian lines. Our anti-aircraft guns in action. Getting hot coffee. King George with the Canadians in the field. British Columbians voting in the field in the late provincial election. A Franco-Canadian Entente. The Miracle of Albert Cathedral. Ypres Cathedral from the Market Square. Burial of Major E. L. Knight of the T. E. Machine Gun Battery. Canadian Graves. Canadian Red Cross men in action. Canadians carrying wounded comrade. Casualty clearing station. Casualties just arrived. Number 3 Casualty Clearing Hospital, A1 Ward. Same hospital, operating room. Canadian Clearing Station. A jolly Canadian officer leaves for England. 